y'all. Welcome back to Ink and Overalls, another episode, guys. We're rocking and rolling. I'm so happy you guys decided to join me today. I hope that you're having a great day wherever you are. And we're just going to jump right into our topic today, which is compost. I had a wonderful dear friend of mine who said, you know, hey, I would love it if you would do an episode about compost. And so I did my episode about soil health and... Then we kind of took a little break in between and now we're bringing it back into the dirt again and we're going to talk about compost. So the question I'm going to answer today is how can I create compost for my garden spaces right here on my homestead? So before I dive into it, I just want to tell you guys, if you don't mind, I would love it if you would like this, like this video, share, subscribe, comment, all the things. Um, if you're listening on audio, it's the same thing. You know, tell your friends and leave us a review if you want to. All those things help so much and I appreciate you. Um, so as we dive into compost, that's not something I would physically ever want to do, but let's talk about it. Um, compost, the definition of compost so that we can square that away before we get started is, um, when I talk about compost, that's a mixture of decayed or decaying organic matter used to fertilize soil. And yes, I read that straight from the internet, but that's the truth. Um, so you think about things that are rotting decaying dying you don't always think of beauty you know beautiful things but we can grow beautiful things from that process and so composting is all about using that process to optimize our gardens we're using it to create beauty in our spaces um usually compost is made by gathering plant material like leaves and grass um, vegetable peels fruit peels all that kind of stuff in a pile or a bin and letting it decompose as a result of the action of aerobic bacteria, fungi, and other organisms. Now, when I say aerobic, that means using air. So that's bacteria that uses air and anaerobic is bacteria that doesn't require like air to thrive and to um, recreate, you know, well, to grow what? basically. So all of those things are part of a healthy compost pile. Not the anaerobic part, but the aerobic part. All those things are parts of a healthy compost pile. Um, good compost helps not only feed your plants, but also inoculates, which is, means puts into your soil um, helpful organisms. It, it puts those things into your soil so that it can continue to grow that ecosystem that we talked about in the soil health episode. If you missed that one, it was a couple of episodes back. I talked all about um, our dirt and how important it is. And compost is just another rung on that ladder of building a good soil system so usually compost can be purchased but ideally we can make amazing compost on our homesteads with just a little bit of intentionality and that's the goal right i mean the less inputs we have to buy the more garden space we can have right <laughs> because i mean it's not cheap you know filling gardens and buying seeds and all those things is an investment you know you can invest as much or as little as you want to sometimes but it is something to think about and whenever you can add compost in and you like made it out of stuff you already had laying around, that's like you created like money right there. It's like dollar bucks, as Bluey would say. <laughs> you got dollar bucks. So you can do that just by being a little intentional in your place. Now I'm going to talk about a few methods of composting today. I'm going to talk about utilizing um, an easy or a lazy compost system the deep bedding system and worm bins. So you'll notice that I left out of that like the textbook composting method. Because first of all, I'm a nurse, but I'm no scientist, okay? So the things I say today are gonna to be based on my personal experience and not by the book as you may find some resources to be. I believe that done is better than perfect. That applies to everything, especially on a homestead, You'll spend all your time like revving up your motor, getting ready to do something and never step out and do it if you wait for perfect. Because, you know, if you think you can't get chickens till you have the perfect chicken coop or you think you can't garden until you have the perfect space or you think you can't compost until you know the perfect method, you're going to spend a lot of time spinning your wheels and really never get off get get kind of off the runway with it you know what I'm saying so done is better than perfect please remember that done is better than perfect and compost is no different you're going to have kitchen scraps guys you're likely going to have animal manure if you're on a homestead okay so let's talk about how we can utilize those things in a realistic way that won't drive us all crazy 
Now, the basic construct of compost piles, have it has to do with carbon and nitrogen and the balance between those two things. So that's kind of on the basic level of composting. You kind of have to need it. You kind of need an understanding of that basic process, okay? So you've got your carbon, you've got your nitrogen. They're kind of sort of opposites of each other, okay? So when they come together and they balance, they can facilitate a breakdown process that results in amazing compost. So when you're building compost in a traditional way, you have to keep this this balance in mind. And even if you're not, like this is this is this is the basics here, okay? We talk lazy composting. Understand this. Understand these pr principles and apply them, and you can make compost, okay? So when I refer to nitrogen, or I may call it a hot item, okay, or a green item, those are things like veggie scraps, fresh animal manure, green grass clippings, coffee grounds, things like that. Those are the things that are going to produce heat as they decompose and things that have to decompose before you can put them on your garden to avoid harming your plants. And so you can't just throw a bunch of nitrogen on your plants because they don't need all that. They can't deal with all that and they'll die. Most of them, not all of them. Some of them know how to utilize that, but for the most part, as a general rule, we don't want to throw just oodles and oodles of nitrogen on our plants without kind of thinking about what we're doing first. And so the nitrogen is going to think of that as kind of the active part of your compost. And then you've got carbon. Carbon is the other type of input that you have to have in your compost. And honestly, I think sometimes it's a little bit harder to find, but, um, this is kind of more of a cold or a neutral addition to your compost. And I also kind of may refer to it as your browns. So you've got your greens, think of your nitrogen, your browns, think of your carbon. And examples of carbon is like the brown or woody materials like autumn leaves, wood chips, sawdust, shredded paper, things like that that you can find are all considered high in carbon. Now, like I said, those are kind of tricky to find sometimes you'll be surprised. You kind of don't, you're like, oh, well, the nitrogen is going to be hard to come by, but it's really not because all of your vegetable scraps and things like that, and even animal, like your chicken, if you clean out your chicken coop and throw it in your compost pile, that's, that's considered nitrogen. You're throwing in a nitrogen source and you have to balance that with some carbon because um, that's how we can help this process happen. So real quickly, let's just break this down. What can we put into a compost pile versus what do we not want to put in a compost pile? So for the purposes of what we're doing here, guys, um, I'm not going to say it can't ever be done, but this is for my, like for this, this video and for the purposes of, of pursuing this, you know, compost venture or whatever, uh, stay away from like dairy, milk, stuff like that. And like meats, shellfish and that kind of stuff. Uh, keep that out of your compost pile and just focus more on like mostly produce type stuff and then like animal waste and like I said coffee grounds things like that so and of course if, you, if there's something you're not sure about you have a question you can always hop on google and ask hey can I put this in my compost pile or you know what should I not put in my compost pile and it'll you know you may find a thousand answers but you can probably find something to go with but um I hope that was helpful because I you know like I said I was kind of talking more about what you can put in but I want to make sure that I kind of also talked about what, what to avoid. If you read a lot about it, there are tons of resources that recommend certain temperatures and methods to speed up or make more efficient the process of composting. Now, I know, I understand the reasons for those. I understand there are certain degree temperatures that kill weed seeds. I understand there are certain temperatures that facilitate better bacteria growing. I understand all of that. But in a realistic way, like I said, I'm speaking from my own experience. Um, you can make your composting more efficient that way. But personally, I like what, what's called the easier, the lazy method of composting because I believe it can be more easily implemented into most homesteads, especially like a backyard homestead, okay? Um, because a lot of us don't have time to sit around measuring the, the temperature of a compost pile, you know, several times a day. Or, you know, making sure everything's just right. You have to sometimes, like I said, done is better than perfect. And that's just always going to be my philosophy. And like I said, it's not the only way of doing things, but it's the way I do things. And so how, what does that look like in your backyard? Say you want to start a compost bin. So what are you going to do? Now you need a bin, right? Or you need some kind of a site where you can kind of off from everything. You can 
start your compost and not have to worry about, you know, animals or, you know, drawing animals close into your place or smells or things like that. Now, some people will tell you that a healthy compost pile will not call, not, will not attract animals and it won't have a smell and all this. But at times, you know, if your balance gets off and you need to fix something, like it can. So, you, you, you know, really I have mine. Mine is in the back. Um, it's probably 20, 30 yards away from my garden. So it's not that far. But, I mean, I never have problems. It's up against the wood line. It's fine. So, let me just tell you how I built it. Okay? I used pallets. And I put them in. And I can actually say I did this because I did. Usually, my husband is the builder. But I actually made my compost pile. My compost bins. And so, I just took. Um, you'll find out why. Because it's so easy. But, <laughs> I just took pallets. And I put them in kind of a U shape. So, I have one like going. I guess if you're looking at me, I'm the compost pile. So, here's the back. And then, like, on each side. So, here's the back. And then I have, like, one here, one here, one here. And I, like, screwed them together, nailed them together, zip tied them together, did something. I don't remember. Anyway, so there's one. And then you kind of go off of that and you make another one. And so then you only need two to make that next one. Does that make sense? So, you kind of got, like, almost a little W shape. Or you can do three if you want to. And all of those areas will be, a, be a, like, an area for your compost. Now, if you want to put... Like, because, yeah, there are slats in the pallets, okay, which is good for aeration, but, you know, if you worry about things falling through or, you know, you just want to be a little bit more conscious about, you know, losing little bits of your compost to the slats, you can always put, like, wire, like uh, chicken wire or hardware cloth around the inside. I have done that before, and it'll kind of help to hold in some of your stuff. Um, also... I don't really put a front on mine, but you can. If you wanted to use slats, I've seen people who have it so fixed so that they can add a board every time as their compost pile grows. They can add a board to kind of keep it in there, and they just keep adding on top, adding on top, adding on top. So for the purposes of me, that's like and, and what I'm teaching you. That's all you're going to need as far as a compost bin if we're talking like traditional compost. We're going to go into a couple of other types of composting you can do. But when it comes to your bin, what you think of as your bins and you're making lots of compost, that's what I would recommend. Now, if you obviously, if you've got, you know, you want to get fancy with it and use, you could use those, um, I think they're cypress or pine fence boards that you can get at Lowe's that are untreated. Those would work really well. I think they're untreated. I don't know. They're like two or three dollars a board. You could, you know, do the same thing kind of with that idea. You can make, you know, look, make it look a pr little prettier if you wanted to. But I find pallets work absolutely great. And so how do you use the bins once you get them, in, once you, you know, get it all done? You just start adding to it. Start, you know, keep you a bucket in your kitchen or like a cute little compost thing on your counter or whatever works for you. Um, you can put a bucket with a lid in the corner if you want to, if you have lots of kitchen scraps and you want to do it that way. And then just empty it every day or so out into your compost pile and it'll start to grow. You'll be surprised at the things you'll be like, oh, wait, I can, I can throw that in compost. I don't have to throw that, you know, that apple core into the garbage. I can throw that into my compost. And so as you do that, you'll want to be mindful to add, as you add your greens, your nitrogen, you want to add your carbon to it as well. So cover that up with some browns, your leaves that you find or if you want to keep a I've seen some people say they keep like a small bag of shavings that you can get from like tractor supply um beside their compost pile and they just kind of take a shovel and like sprinkle a shovel full over it every now and then if they notice flies are getting bad or a smell or if they just need some browns that's what they do and it works fine for them and that's an easy way of keeping them right there they're not that expensive and a bag would go a long way you don't need that many um and so you know you add your greens add your browns Whenever you add some more greens, add some more browns. And if you, and another thing to remember as you're building is you don't want, your pile is going to decompose quicker if there's some moisture in it. Now you don't want to soak it, but spraying it, you know, every now and then if you notice it looks dry or it's been a dry, you know, it hasn't rained in a while or whatever, you can spray it down to kind of add to, and because that'll kind of speed up the process of decomposition because it just decomposes better whenever it's moist. Um, so 
Keep the shavings nearby to sprinkle if you notice it. Wet it down sometimes. No, don't so saturate it, but like sprinkle, you know, wet it well every now and then. And just watch it pile up and go. And it's going to break down naturally because that's just what stuff does. Okay. Um, when it gets full, now you can turn it if you want to. But what the, from the lazy perspective I'm giving it to you, you don't even have to really do that. What I would recommend, like I've seen people do and what I've read about the lazy method and this is what ends up happening in my life is I pile it up and then I will turn it basically once after it gets kind of full. I will take all that, turn it over to the next bin and that way it's been turned, it's been flipped and then I'll start my next pile. And that is going to be that what that pile that I turned obviously is going to be compost quicker. It's going to, because it's almost ready at that point. So then I have this new pile going while this pile continues to age. And then you can do it one more time, flip it over again. When this one's ready, move it to this one. Then you have your original bin once again, ready to start. And then by the time you do all that, you've got some finished compost in that last one that's ready to be pulled out. Now, how are you going to know it's ready? Um, really, I mean, yes, you can soil test it. You can do all the things, but you're going to know because it looks like dirt and it smells like dirt. I mean, it's no longer like you may have some chips of some larger pieces in there. Um, it doesn't have to be super fine or anything, but like you're going to be able to pick it up and it's going to feel like soft, like soil. And it's going to have that dirt, real fresh smell to it. It's not going to stink. It's not going to smell like have a real high like um, ammonia smell or any of that. It's just going to smell like fresh, good dirt. And that's how you know when it's ready. I mean, it'll look done. You'll know it's done. And it's ready to use at that point. And like I said, you just continue the process. And so with winter coming, you know, I think this is a great time to start one because you, a lot of us, we're not out doing as many things this time of the year as we are in the spring. Spring gets really busy with projects. So it's really a good time to take a nice day and get out, find you some pallets and, and put throw together a compost bin if you don't already have one. Um, now with winter coming, it will slow down the process. The cold weather does slow down the process of the decomposition of the pile, but you can still build one and you can still get it going. And as it warms up, it's going to, it's going to, I mean, it's going to heat up. The process is going to get quicker, but you um, can also, if you live somewhere where it gets super cold and you really want to kind of facilitate having that compost a little bit earlier, you can cover it with a tarp or something and just check on it every couple of days. But if you do that, you may want to turn it and make sure you're adding enough browns to it because you kind of got to be careful whenever you cover stuff. It kind of gets, it can get anaerobic sometimes and get kind of stinky and icky. Um, depending on how wet it gets under there and it kind of holds on to that. It doesn't dry out the same. So that's just something you can do, but just be mindful. You may want to have your eye on it a little bit more often than if you're just like letting it chill out there, if that makes any sense. Um, so that is how it's done as far as I'm concerned when it comes to lazy composting. That's my method I'm passing to you guys, okay? Now, um, like I said, you can get as technical as you want to with it. You can buy a compost um, thermometer. You can be all scientific with it. If that is what makes you happy, you go for it. But if you're, you know, a person who maybe is a little bit busy and doesn't feel like dedicating quite as much time to compost, don't feel like you can't do it because you can. It's not, it doesn't have to be as complicated as people make it out to be. All right, so a couple of other methods I want to throw out there. Um... Deep bedding is one of them. So I mentioned it, I think, briefly in the my um, episode I did about why I have the animals I have. So deep bedding is just whenever you utilize, basically, your animals going to use the bathroom wherever they are, right? So um, especially in the wintertime, if they're in their chicken coops a lot or if they're in your barn a lot, you can add, like, fresh shavings to as they, as they produce their poop. Basically, that's your nitrogen. You add fresh shavings or straw, not hay, speaking from experience. Anyway, add that to your bedding. You know, as it gets added, it composts itself, basically. And honestly, in the wintertime, it kind of, especially if you're in a really cold climate, that process can help somewhat to warm your animal enclosure, like your barn or your chicken coop. And so it's kind of like two things at once. And then by the end of the winter, you can kind of push some of the more recent stuff back and underneath there, you've got usable compost. Okay. Um, we do this, we do it with our chickens and in our barn also. Now in my barn, personally, I have, um, 
I have goats, and so they strow hay. So hay ends up being in my barn. Now, when I can, I love to get hay that's not been sprayed or that, you know, supposedly hasn't been sprayed with Grazon, which is a, an herbicide that can contaminate your garden. And, you know, sometimes you can get your hands on, you know, unsprayed hay, but a lot of times you don't know where it came from if you're buying it from a feed store somewhere or you can't guarantee. And so you have to be mindful of that. What I do personally um, is I still use our bedding from the barn, but I wait until it's very aged and I usually use it in beds that I'm like number one, that I'm not going to plant tomatoes or peppers or any kind of nightshade in because they're extremely susceptible to it, to grazon contamination. It makes their leaves all shrivel up and it stunts their growth. So if I'm going to use, for example, I used my goat bedding in a couple of new beds that I had um, this year. So we feel, we pulled back and we used the compost, which is already a couple years old, the compost from our barn, and put it in there. But now in that bed, I planted squash, and things like that, melons, because those things can utilize nitrogen, like really high nitrogen. So um, if it, if there were, was a little bit of it that wasn't as broken down as I wanted it to be, that would be fine. And then also, they're not as susceptible to herbicide contamination. And I didn't have any problems with it. They, grow, they grew wonderfully. I had, I had a beautiful beds and it was great. So that's how we utilize deep bedding. Like I said, you have to be mindful. You have to keep in mind, like, where did this, you know, what's in this? Um, is it, is it hay that could possibly contaminate my garden? And if that's the case, you may want to throw it out, like pull it out to a larger compost pile at age for a couple of years. Um, or use it, like I said, the way I do, which is, I'm just, I stay mindful of it. I know I can't plant any kind of nightshades in it or anything. And I wait till it's at least already at least a year or two old before I put it in there. And it's been fine. I mean, it's, it's just what we do. It's, it's just, I have too much out there not to use it because I mean, like I said, animals use the bathroom guys. And it's like, I mean, you add to it, add to it. And before you know it, you've got, you know, several inches of useful compost. I'm not just gonna not use that because I mean, even if I buy organic compost from the store, there's with the world we live in right now. And you can, a quick Google search will tell you there have been plenty of people who have had gray zone contamination, um, from store-bought products like uh, cow manure and things like that because it's, it's sprayed onto the fields. The cows consume the the grass that's there that's also been sprayed. It kills the, the, um, the weeds, leaves the grass. The cows eat the grass and it's in their system and then they poop it out and there it is in your cow manure. And even after it's been processed, even after, even if they don't think that that particular cow had that, you know, exposure or whatever, it's just, there's just so many variables out there that you can still get herbicide contamination from store-bought things. And so, in my opinion, I use my deep bedding from my um, my barn. I'm mindful about it, and I, I'm fine with that. But that's, you know, up to you. Once again, we all do things differently, and we all do things for different reasons. But, like I said, that would just be wasteful for me not to use that. And so, um, I use it. All right, and I also want to say, I want to take a quick moment to say, rabbit manure is ready to go. You've got rabbits, as soon as they use, you know, once once it's out of their bodies, it's ready to go in the garden, guys. It's cold, you don't have to worry about it. Be thoughtful, don't put like a whole bunch of, like, I wouldn't grow root vegetables immediately in it. I wouldn't necessarily grow anything that grows low to the ground, like right away. I'd let it age a little bit, but as far as the process goes, it's not going to hurt your plants if you just put it straight on there. So rabbit manure is always a good go-to. Um, last but certainly not least, worms. So worm composting. Worm composting is something that you can utilize in even the smallest of places. Um, you can have a small bin of red regular worms. They're composting worms. It's not just regular ones you find out, out in the yard. I mean, sometimes, but no. You order a specific type of worm. Uh, I order red wrigglers from Uncle Jim's Worm Farm, for example, online. They come in a little bag. You get them and you set them up in their bin. And they, you like feed them, you give them your compost. So like banana peels, eggshells, things like that you put in the bin. And as that stuff decomposes, the worms use the, that organic matter to turn it into their castings, which in, in result is just an amazing compost that is so potent, can be used even in small amounts to make a big impact in your garden. And, um, 
you know, I won't go into like every step by step of how to set up a worm bin. If y'all want to know that, let me know. I could make a whole episode just on that. Um, but my friend Natalie on Instagram, she's Hey It's a Good Life. She's got tons of information about worm farming. Um, lots of reels, lots of free info there. And she also has a course that you can buy. Um, but like I said, I would be happy to kind of walk y'all through it more if that's something anybody's interested in knowing. But, um, so how do I use the worm casting? So once you, you have the worms, they're producing within like three months, they've completely turned over whatever was usually was in your bin and all that becomes useful compost. How do you know it's ready? Their castings are kind of a little bit clumpy. And really dark. And so you'll know it's different from the soil that you put in there to begin with. And so their castings will be kind of clumpy, um, really dark. If you've ever bought like a pack of worms from like a bait store, you know what it looks like in there. And that's kind of how you know it's ready. And you can put it directly on your, your garden, around your plants. Or you can also make a compost tea, which is one of my favorite ways to utilize drop their um, castings because you don't need a lot. You can take... A few cu a couple of cups full put in like a cheesecloth and you can actually like put it in a bucket with water and a bubble I use a bubbler for mine that keeps the air once again aerobic instead of anaerobic um I use a bubbler but you can also just agitate it when you go by it you know a few times a day as that sits there I usually put molasses or something like that in there to facilitate the growth of the like bacteria and fungi and all those things to feed it basically and inspire the growth and so and then I just let it go for a couple of days and you get this amazing compost tea and you can foliar feed this so you can spray it on your plants and they can utilize it on their leaves or you can um you know put it around your plants at the base there's a lot of things you can do with it um but it just packs a really big punch and it, even though it's just a small amount of castings you have to use for that and I find that to be really really cool Especially considering like a worm bin takes up like this much space. So even if you're in an apartment or a townhouse or if you just don't have a whole lot of room, space, whatever, it's an excellent way to start composting. And I mean, I, I believe, you know, do that in addition to your large bin because you can use all of it in different ways. Um, also, a good thing about worms is it's in a bin so you can bring it inside if the temp is going to drop way too low and you're worried about your worms. You can bring them into your garage or even into your house. They're not going to hurt anything. They're fine. It doesn't It doesn't really stink. It doesn't, um, I, I don't know. It's just like, yes, there's going to be an ecosystem in that bin, but it's contained to that bin and you can, like, if you need to bring it inside, you can. You're already going to have all this waste that you're going to produce. Like, I mean, we're going to, we're going to have kitchen scraps and so and we're going to have manure from our animals and so you might as well utilize that turn it into compost instead of just letting it like hang out and you, before you know it you've got a thriving garden from you know poop and garbage basically <laughs> it doesn't sound very glamorous y'all but it's it, it is though like as a homesteader don't we know the value guys of of just a, a nice pile of organic material organic matter for our gardens I mean like it's just so valuable and so hopefully these methods gave you some idea of how you can utilize your you know your property your family's waste your animals waste just all of those things to nourish your garden in the coming years guys um because it's it's a process that's going to happen anyway. If you if you throw it in a garbage in a landfill somewhere, it's going to break down. If it's out in your chicken coop, it's going to break down. You might as well take it and be intentional and make it work for you and put it to work so that it can work in your garden and you can see the fruits of it, right? So I hope that you guys learned something today. I hope that you'll go out and try new things and don't be afraid to. And like I said, go you therefore and compost and I will talk to you guys later. You can find me on Wednesdays at Media, uh, Wally Media Group on YouTube at 7 Central Standard Time, and of course, it's up after that point too, and then on Sundays, I upload audio to podcast platforms like iHeartRadio, um, iTunes, like Apple Podcasts, and um, what's that other one? Spotify, and there's a couple of other ones on there too, so you can find me there, or you can go to my website, inkandoveralls.com, and there's a link there to the podcast. You can listen, and also there's links for merch. There's links to my um, shop where I sell salves, tinctures, and soaps, things like that, 
And also find me on social media, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, not YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I am Streamwater Farm across the board on there. And I hope to see you guys in the next episode. So I hope that you will get out there, find the beauty wherever you are, make some compost, and that you'll have an awesome day. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.